So a couple years ago, Joanne and Hunter and I were going to the beautiful town of Seidel, Illinois. Now, if that town existed in Connecticut, it would be Seidel. But here in central Illinois, it's Seidel. And we were going there because a friend of ours was starting a new contemporary worship service once a month on Saturday nights. And we went to the, very, the, the maiden voyage to kind of help kick it off with them. We had never been to Seidel. Had no idea where Seidel was. Now, what I should have done was just print off from MapQuest. But when you have a GPS in your phone, why print off anything? So I just punched in the coordinate, you know, the, the address on my, on my phone, and off we went. And we're driving, and we're absolutely in the middle of nowhere. You know, CR 947 West by, L, you know, I don't even have any idea what all that means. We're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And we're doing okay on time, but we're, I guess, a little wrong. So we're starting to push the time just a touch. But we're like, okay, we're doing fine. We get about halfway there. It takes about 30, 35 minutes, some, somewhere in there to get there. We get about halfway there, and we're like, okay, I think we're going to do fine, but I don't have any idea where we are. Thank goodness for GPS. And all of a sudden, my phone says, you have lost GPS signal. <laughs> oh, snap, son. Now we're out in the middle of nowhere. We don't have any idea where we're going. So we just kind of wandered aimlessly a bit, thinking that Seidel was that general direction and praying that something amazing would happen. And just about the moment that we were had decided that maybe we weren't going to make it and maybe we just ought to turn around and go back, all of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, my phone says, you now have GPS signal. We're like, victory in Jesus. We made it. We, we actually got there only a few minutes late. Today we're going to talk about not finding where you're going. Week two of just a short five-week series looking at the post-resurrection appearances. After, after Easter and between then and, and uh, Jesus' ascension into heaven, looking at, at some, of those, some of those appearances. We're calling it after the show, because as I said, everybody builds up to Easter. But what happens after Easter? So that's what we're looking at. Just an overview, not all of the appearances, but enough of them to help us get a feel for what happened between Easter morning and ascension Sunday. Each week, we're going to attach a song to it. It's the name of the message each week, and it's a song that relates to the story we're talking about. Today, the song is, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. And it was performed by? You two. You two. Absolutely. You two. I did some, I did some reading on it, because I always assume that Bono writes everything that U2 does, but not so much with this song. It was a group collaboration on this one. The lead singer, Bono, which by the way I'm sure is not the name his mama gave him, was interested in the theme of spiritual doubt. And frankly, if you're familiar with their really seminal album, uh, The Joshua Tree, the whole album is about that really. Meanwhile, lead guitarist The Edge, also not the name his mama gave him, had written these words, still haven't found what I'm looking for in a notebook. And then he sat down and wrote a chord sequence to go along with that. Well, then the two of them got together, and out of those ideas grew this song. They ended up with what was the second track on their 1987 album, The Joshua Tree. And in the lyrics, you can hear that whole sense of, of uh, spiritual doubt. Listen to these words from the song. I have spoke with the tongue of angels. I have held the hand of the devil. It was warm in the night, and I was cold as a stone. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. To me, that sounds like somebody who's crying out to God, looking for what they don't have but desperately want. And then as if Jesus responds to them, you get this in the song. I have climbed highest mountains. I have run through the fields only to be with you. I have run. I have crawled. I have scaled these city walls only to be with you. You ever felt like you were at the end of your rope? Just hanging on for dear life, hoping the rope held. And then somebody says something to you out of the blue, or, or maybe you hear a song, or, or you read a story, and you realize that the message is not from the person speaking or singing or writing, but the message is really from God. Maybe through them, maybe they were a conduit, but the message comes from God to you. It's as if, it's as if God is speaking directly to you at that moment. That's what we're going to look at today. And I want you to hear these words from 2 Chronicles chapter 15. The Lord is with you as long as you are with Him. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. 
But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach them. They were without instruction. But in their time of trouble, they turned to the Lord, to Israel's God. They sought him, and they found him. You see, sometimes the answer that we're looking so hard for is right there in front of us, and we just don't see it. Fred was sitting in a restaurant with some of his business associates having a business lunch, when out of nowhere a distinguished looking gentleman rushes up to the table and grabs his hand and starts shaking his hand vigorously, all the while calling him Joe instead of Fred. And he starts fondly recounting the great times that they had together in the army. Well, Fred served in the Merchant Marines, and so he finally gently told the man that he was mistaken. Case of mistaken identity. You had me confused with someone else, he told him. Well, the man was terribly embarrassed, and he apologized profusely, and he left the restaurant. A week later, Fred is back in that same restaurant having lunch, and he bumps into the same man again. This time, the man comes up and hugs him and repeats the same poignant story about two army buddies who had not seen each other for years and how great it was. And finally, before Fred could remind him, I'm not that guy, the man says to him, you know what the crazy thing is? You'll never believe this, but last week I was in here and I met a guy who looks just like you. <laughs> the oldest and maybe most time-worn convention in entertainment is the mistaken identity storyline. I mean, what 60s and 70s sitcom did not use that storyline? The evil twin storyline. Gilligan's Island, I love you, but I love Gilligan's Island when I was little. They used that for every character, I think, and some of them more than once. They really liked the evil twin plot line. It's true in movies, mistaken identity, great movies. Uh, the, the Great Dictator with Charlie Chaplin, The Court Jester with Danny Kaye, North by Northwest with Cary Grant, books like The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain and Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. They're all based firmly on the premise of someone being mistaken for somebody else. Mistaken identity. And in today's story, Jesus shows up in a rather unlikely place and we get this case of mistaken identity. Hear these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to the town of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking about everything that happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus came near and he began walking with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. What are these things you're talking about while you walk? He said to them. The two followers stopped and they looked very sad. And one who was named Cleopas said, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know what just happened there? And then, starting with what Moses and the prophets had said about him, Jesus began to explain everything that had been written about him in the scriptures. And when they came near the town of Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he were going to go on further. But they begged him, saying, stay with us, it's late, it's almost night. And so he went in to stay with them. And when Jesus was at the table with them, he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he divided it, and he gave it to them. And at that moment, they were allowed to recognize Jesus. But when they saw who he was, he disappeared. And they said to each other, it felt like our, a fire was burning in us when Jesus talked to us on the road, explaining the scriptures to us. So you got this classic road to Emmaus story. It takes place on the road to Emmaus, which interestingly enough, nobody's even sure where it was. There are about three towns over there now that claim to be the historic Emmaus, but there's really no proof of any of them. But you get these two amazingly ordinary people well, only one of them is even given a name. Did you notice that? Cleopas and his friend. Wouldn't you like being the and his friend for history? You're Cleopas' friend in the Bible. And they're walking along an amazingly ordinary road when suddenly this stranger shows up and he injects himself into their conversation, into the middle of their grief. And isn't that the way it seems to happen? When you're perfectly fine to see other people, when you kind of want to see other people, it seems like you never run into anybody you know. But when, like Greta Garbo, all you want is to 
to be alone. Here comes somebody butting in where they're not wanted. People say, well, how could they not recognize Jesus? How could his disciples, his followers, not recognize him? Well, notice it said they were kept from recognizing him. But I think it's also important to remember, he probably looked a little familiar to them. They probably thought, haven't I seen you somewhere before? You look familiar. But you also have to remember, they weren't looking for Jesus. They weren't out hunting for Jesus because as far as they knew, he was dead. So they weren't looking for him in the first place. And maybe their failure to recognize Jesus on the road to Emmaus was just a continuance of their failed failure to truly recognize him before he was crucified. But to really understand who he was and why he had come. Because you see, recognition is not just a function of memory. Recognition is also a function of relationship. Book of Ephesians chapter 1, it says this. I don't stop giving thanks to God for you when I remember you in my prayers. I pray that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call. What is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among his believers? What is the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among us believers? This power is conferred by the energy of God's powerful strength. So let's go back to Cleopas and his buddy for just a minute. Did you notice that they weren't following instructions? They weren't following the directions. Were they on their way to Galilee to meet with Jesus as they had been told? No. Were they staying in Jerusalem, waiting for the dramatic appearance of the Holy Spirit, as had been suggested? No. They're out for a Sunday afternoon stroll, trying to put some distance between them and the place where they saw their world crash down around them. See, it seems to me that sometimes when the hurt is so deep, you just have to get away from it all for a while. And we've all been there. We've all been on the road to Emmaus in our lives. That temporary hiding place, that momentary distraction, the, the change of scenery that we so desperately need sometimes. And in, in the middle of all that, we hear footsteps. And a stranger comes intruding into the middle of our misery. And we don't want to talk to him. We don't want to talk to anybody. But here this person is, horning in. And in an effort to be nice, we invite him to dinner. And being polite, we pass him the bread first. And then suddenly, our eyes are open, and we recognize that it is Jesus who is in our midst. And we say, Lord, forgive me, I didn't realize it was you. Notice it was only when they broke the bread together that Cleopas and his friend recognized Jesus. Their eyes were open, and they recognized the risen Savior. And then, in the twinkling of an eye, Jesus vanishes. He's gone. And they're left to ask each other, weren't our hearts burning inside of us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? And so they immediately change their plans. Now they have a purpose, and they immediately go back to Jerusalem, and they meet with the other disciples. And they tell them about what happened and, and how they had seen Jesus but didn't recognize him until they broke bread together. You see, the reality of this story is that moments of true revelation, those, those sacred times when we feel the presence of God in a real and a powerful way, those are almost always in the middle of frighteningly ordinary times. We always want it to be the parting of the Red Sea, the big major revelations. But quite frankly, God almost always shows up in the middle of our ordinary lives. And if we only look with our eyes, and if we only listen with our ears, when that happens, all we see is the garden, or a guy on the shore encouraging people to fish, or a stranger on the road to Emmaus. But when we allow our eyes to be open and our ears to truly hear, suddenly we recognize Jesus for who he is. And then we know that God understands our situation. 
that God recognizes our, our weariness and our sorrow and our sadness. And in those moments, sometimes with sighs too deep for words, we make a strong personal connection with the risen Christ. And we're able to hear Jesus' voice when he says, do this in remembrance of me. I don't know about you, but I am delighted with the fact that Jesus being alive today is not dependent on my ability to understand how the resurrection actually happened. I'm delighted about that because how did it happen? I have no clue how it happened. We tend to misunderstand who Jesus is and what he's about, just like these disciples, Cleopas and his friend did. We tend to worship the wrong things. We tend to chase the wrong dreams. We tend to get taken in by false messiahs. But in the midst of it, here's the cool part. God just keeps right on loving us, often despite who we are. And when that happens, and when we recognize that God loves us despite who we are, suddenly Easter becomes so real that you can almost taste it. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say to me over the years of my ministry, I don't really need to go to church, Pastor, to find God. I can find God out on the golf course just fine. And then they look at me with a little conspiratorial smile and they say, God's everywhere, isn't he? I say, yeah, absolutely God is everywhere. Absolutely you can find God on the golf course. But it is only in worship with other believers where the scripture is shared and the bread is broken that you are most likely to encounter God in transformative ways. So why come to church? Is it because it's the decent thing to do? Is it because you like the music? Is it because it looks good to other people? Maybe it serves as a glorified temporary medication. But the best reason to go to church is to find God and to open ourselves to God on our own road to Emmaus. Because when we are in worship, we hear the echoes of eternity. Think about that. We hear the echoes of eternity. We are connected with all the saints who have gone before us. So we need to go to God and open ourselves to Him and let Him speak to our hearts. Now back to the song for just a moment before we close. Back to still haven't found what I'm looking for. The last verse of the song, I think, offers us an absolute true understanding behind this Emmaus story. I don't know if that's what they had in mind when they wrote it, but to me, I read this last verse and I hear exactly what this story is about. Hear these words. I believe in the kingdom come when all the colors will bleed into one. But yes, I'm still running. You broke the bonds and you loosed my chains. You carried the cross of my shame. You know I believe it. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You see, that's the beauty of God's kingdom. Because in God's kingdom, truly in God's kingdom, all the colors bleed into one. There is no black. There is no white. There's no old and young or male and female or rich or poor or whatever. Whatever we build up to separate each other. Because we are radically equal in God's eyes. Regardless of what society thinks of you or me out there, and regardless of how we are classified out there, in here we are radically equal in the eyes of God. And yet we continue to run. And we continue to search. But the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that He broke our bonds. He loosed our chains. He carried the cross of our shame. Not His, but ours. So have you found what you're looking for? Have you found what you're looking for? If, if you haven't, stop looking. It's right here. It's right here. What you seek and the part of you that simply refuses to be complete can be made whole in the healing and the saving presence of Jesus Christ. This week, I encourage you to turn to Jesus on your road to Emmaus. Recognize Him for who He is and utter those words that Thomas uttered last week, my Lord and my God. Now, as the musicians come forward, we're going to do things a little differently this morning. We're going to do something we don't do nearly often enough. We're going to have a good old altar call. 
In a minute, they're going to sing the opening verse to Just As I Am. Thank you. I knew somebody back there would remember. We're going to, they're going to sing the opening verse of Just As I Am. You're going to be invited to sing it with them. And then we're going to take some time of prayer before we move into a song called The Altar. The lyrics for the song, The Altar, will be up there on the screen, and you are welcome to sing them. I'll be honest, it's not the easiest song to pick up and sing along with, but you are welcome to. But more so than that, what I would encourage you to do, if you feel like you're lost, if you feel like you've been searching and haven't found, I would encourage you to take that time during that part of the song to come to the altar and pray to God. And I was thinking about this, and I'm sure she won't mind if I single her out, but I don't know if you heard Mary trying to get us clapping on the first song. And I know that as good Methodist was it, a buddy of mine says, I went to a, a revival and it was so stirring. One of my Methodist friends actually took one hand out of his pocket. <laughs> and, and that is us. Let's be honest. But we're not terribly demonstrative. So I know it's hard for some people to clap. And you don't have to clap. But I also want to encourage those people who want to do that to feel comfortable to do that. And the same goes for coming to the altar. That's a hard thing. It's out of almost everybody's comfort zone. Because you think to yourself, well, if I go up, people are going to think something horrible is going on in my life. And I don't want them to think that. Who cares what people think? If you feel like you need to have a special connection to God today, when we open up the altar, come. Come. And don't worry about what anybody else thinks, but just come to God. Would you stand as we sing as we pray?